the idea of just sustainability really is to try and get uh, people to look at environmental quality and human equality not as opposite not as like the media would have us believe jobs or the environment um, it's to try and see that human equality and environmental quality are both goals that can be delivered together through really reimagining the way we do things on this planet and one of them you've identified is is I think the sharing economy I mean just thinking about here in Boston and how Hubway cycles this cycle share has just gone off the record in terms of its success the supplier can't keep up with supplying bikes and bike stations um, Zipcar Airbnb um, there's a whole move I think with your generation the Millennials to look at utility rather than ownership and I think this is the key that you know I mean living in the United States now and trying to think about how we turn this great super tanker around this consumption super tanker that is the United States how do we do that well we can't say to Americans you know just give everything up but what we could say is how about not owning so much stuff but having the utility of stuff still I think that's a that's a better sell it's an easier sell to a public that is wedded to consumption now you know I'm a pragmatist um, yes I would rather people just cut down on what they consume I can see in the sharing economy that we're driving the wedge into the understanding that more is better I think people are beginning to understand now that walkable neighborhoods are really nice places that sharing a car is no big deal it's it's a great thing to do I do that I use car share I don't own a car um, so so I think the sharing economy has the potential uh, as it grows to really start to redefine um, just the way that we interact with stuff and goods but also I think it's going to have um, you know knock-on effects with manufacturers I mean for instance um, how are the car companies going to reconcile the fact that your generation doesn't want to buy cars in as great a volume as your parents generation how are they going to do that they're going to have to make some changes so I think you know this is an optimistic moment a very optimistic moment and that you know the whole sharing economy I think is is poised to really take off who do you think needs to um, other than business um, forward thinking progressive business is there anything that the, the government um, for example governments around the world can do to to um, influence this oh yeah I, I absolutely think so there's a huge role for government and and fortunately some governments are starting to um, look at notions of well-being on the understanding that well-being is not necessarily predicated on more stuff but it's predicated on more quality of life based issues and here in the United States we've got the city of Somerville which is part of the Boston metro area we have um, the state of Maryland city of Seattle um, I understand that President Sarkozy the former president of France um, David Cameron have been looking at you know what well-being looks like um, in terms of policy and planning processes so these are all the beginnings I think of a quite a hopeful uh, trend that uh, I can see is going to gather momentum. I can really only see this gathering momentum, um, you know, as your generation becomes more influential uh, in, in terms of your consumer power. Um, what is so just about sharing? If you work hard, you achieve more. Why should someone who's worked hard for their stuff share it with someone else? Well, you know. Uh, let me just flip that because you know <laughs> the question I thought you were going to ask me and the question that my students and I debate uh, is you know sharing is trendy sharing is fashionable sharing is cool it's great for those of us who can choose to share but what about people who have no choice but to share and you know that then is 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 a different kind of uh, situation to those of us who are willingly sharing um, and we need to work on that. I don't, you know, I'm asking the right questions, I think, but I don't have all the answers. Um, 
what can I've heard a little bit of this really, but what can or should people be sharing? Um, examples. I think you've given them examples of car sharing uh, with tra in transportation. Um, what other areas would you um, do you think? You know, just to go back to the whole premise of the city, the city and successful cities are about sharing space. So, you know, it's not just sharing stuff, it's about sharing space. And how do we share space more creatively? And how do we design spaces that are culturally inclusive, not culturally exclusive? How do we use space to increase cultural diversity rather than to decrease cultural diversity? Can you perhaps give some examples of um, culturally um, inclusive projects that, that you know of, or it's easier exclusive um, uh, projects that um, should have been done a different way, um, just to uh, maybe create that picture in people's minds? Yeah, I mean, just so this idea really, um, about 10 years ago, I read a, a book um, which was looking at um, you know reimagining urban parks um, and the main premise of the book was saying that you know that lack of use of public spaces today is not so much to do with sort of criminality but it's to do with the design and management of space in ways that um, do not invite uh, a lot of people in and one let me give you one really good example in the early 90s uh, I was asked by Hertfordshire County Council to look at um, a country park on the edge of North London and Hertfordshire, right in the green belt, Oldenham Country Park. Um, and they were concerned, the parks people, they were concerned about the fact that the park was about 100, 150 years old, and so it was designed with a very different clientele in mind. North London has looked very different 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So as I walked around the park, I was looking and thinking, wow, this is really colourful, interesting. There were groups of um, women in saris. There were Turkish and Cypriot and Greek people in extended family groups. And then I looked at the park benches, and they were the standard park benches for two adults and two kids. And I'm thinking, hang on, this doesn't work anymore. Um, we have these extended groups. Where do people sit? I don't think anybody's thinking about that kind of thing. You know, <laughs> people need to sit down somewhere. Most people go to parks as a social event. Certainly, most people from minority groups. Uh, a lot of <laughs> a lot of park design, though, is designed around solitary use um, because of our sort of transcendentalist uh, ideals of you know being. In nature alone whereas as I say other groups think of it as a more social space so how can places like Oldenham Country Park be reimagined and redesigned around a very much more diverse society with more diverse interests just coming back to the sharing theme um, is sharing sorry if sharing is such a great idea how come it's niche and not mainstream at the moment well, I think the reason why sharing is, is, is a niche issue and not a mainstream issue at the moment is because, you know, our economy is structured around ownership. It isn't structured around sharing. Um, and we are forcing, we who are, you know, at the forefront in thinking about sharing and um, in doing sharing, we're at the forefront of forcing some changes. Uh, as I said, um, you know, I think that the motor industry eventually is going to have to wake up and see the the, the, the changes that are happening um, that I read about all the time in terms of your generation not buying cars in anything like the numbers that, that, their, their, sort of, uh, that their parents did. Um, so it will remain niche until you know, we hit various tipping points. I mean, we do know that the hotel industry is scared to death of Airbnb and couch surfing. Because, I mean, remember, people in my parents' and grandparents' generation who were born um, sort of, you know, between the, the wars, between the First and Second World War, or around the time of the Second World War, 
sharing was just not a trendy thing. Sharing was what you did then. You shared school clothes. You know, you had hand-me-downs. Um, that was the normal thing to do. Um, what about maybe let's look at the positives of you know how can sharing improve our well-being? So I think you know that there are positives, and as I say, I think what we've yet to explore is you know how do we get to that point where we get groups to mix. Urban agriculture is a pretty good way of doing that, and allotments tend to be quite good ways. There's a focus around agriculture, and you know one thing we haven't talked about really a lot is food and you know for 25 years I've been doing this work on sort of just sustainability it's, it's crazy that I've only really just come through my 2011 book on cultivating food justice I've only come to realize that you know in food we have the beginnings of conversations about climate change about use of public space about cultural diversity I mean food is a great place to enter conversations with people. You must have heard people say, um, you know, that we have a lot, what difference can I make? Um, so what difference can people make um, and, and when we're framing it around sharing, um, particularly in cities? You know, individual change is not going to give us the depth and speed of change that we need. But, you know, individuals as collectivities pushing this notion that hey we understand now we don't need to fill our homes and our lives with stuff but we want utility that is going to have huge change that's going to have a lot of change and you know not just in trendy places like Cambridge Massachusetts where I am now it's going to have change in in, in other places as people begin to realize that they don't need and that success does not necessarily mean having a car in your driveway. It might mean having an unlocked mountain bike in your driveway. Uh, that might mean what, what is success. And, and I think what, what we have to do, organizations like yourself, and especially people like the New Economics Foundation, who I think are you know, doing some fabulous work, um, we do need to redefine progress and redefine success. And the more I live here in the United States, I've been here for 14 years now, the more I realize that, that we do need to redefine the American dream. I mean, it's actually almost redefining itself. This generation, your generation here in the United States, are not going to have that lift up, um, that, that increase in standard of living that their parents dreamt that every generation would have. That's not going to happen this time. And this may be the fracture between the old dream and the new dream. You know, one, of the problems, one of the problems with the American dream is that it isn't the American dream anymore, it's the global dream. And, you know, and that, I think, gives a role to the United States in changing. It is the one that has to reorientate the dream um, away from a materialist dream, which clearly, you know, the environmental footprint, environmental space analysis, um, Oxfam's donut show us that really we cannot just continue to to consume, but that you know we can have a better quality of life. Everyone can have a better quality of life. We can increase well-being, but we cannot indefinitely increase um, stuff. And so, redefining the American dream, redefining the global dream of stuff, I think is the 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 most urgent priority. You know, when you think about it, the American dream was evolved at a time when there was a very high level of resources, low level of technology to exploit the resources, and population levels were very low. And now the obverse is true. That we have, you know, we have the ability to basically vacuum the planet for resources. We have rising populations, uh, and we have dwindling resources. So, again, we need to reinvent the dream around a non-material future or non-material, you know, lower consumption future where the focus is on well-being, sharing and, um, you know, the quality of life, spending social capital, not spending our natural capital. Friends of the Earth. Environmental group Friends of the Earth. Friends of the Earth. Friends of the Earth are actually quite good at getting laws passed.